Thank you. I'm going to start by uh, telling a story about my vacation last summer. Uh, my husband and I took our kids to Paris for their very first time. And we did all the tourist things, Eiffel Tower, Notre Dame, and we strolled down Champs-Élysées, and after a while we got tired and wanted to sit down and rest. And of all the charming sidewalk cafes in, uh, in Paris, where do you think we ended up? <laughs> Everybody says that. <laughs> we ended up at Starbucks. <laughs> I have a confession to make. I love Starbucks. <laughs> we don't have that in Norway, so when I'm abroad I get kind of excited about going to a Starbucks. <coughs> now I make my kids go there too. <laughs> and here's a picture of them at Starbucks in Paris. And they love it too. You know, there's not many places you can go into and children can behave that way and we don't get kicked out, so... <laughs> okay. Let me tell you the story about Starbucks and why people like myself and my kids uh, like it so much. The very first Starbucks uh, opened in Seattle in 1986. And the CEO, Howard Schultz, he was inspired by the Italian espresso bars. Uh, so picture this. The baristas all wore bow ties. Opera music filled the room nonstop. Uh, the coffee was perfectly brewed and served in ceramic cups only. And the, uh, the coffee were taken standing up, like this, because people were on their way to work, so there were no chairs in the room. Now, Schultz took all of these ideas with him to the United States, because there they had nothing like this. And this was what the, the very first Starbucks looked like. So this, does this remind you of the Starbucks that we visit today? Mm. No. And why is that? Because Starbucks have emerged from customer feedback. Because the bow ties proved to be too impractical. And people started complaining about the incessant opera. <laughs> <laughs> and those who weren't in a hurry wanted to sit down. And then there was the issue about the milk. Because at Starbucks, they only served whole milk. And people wanted non-fat milk. And at Starbucks, this led to one of the biggest debates in history, in their history. And even the mentioning of non-fat milk was looked upon as treason. And, and uh, CEO Howard Schultz even said at one point, we will never offer non-fat milk. It is not who we are. <laughs> well, it's who they are now. <laughs> and the reason that we love Starbucks, well, at least I do, is because they have become what they are out of customer feedback. So, four years ago, I was given a fantastic opportunity. Uh, Stonia Municipality in Norway was seeking a psychologist who could help them uh, to build a mental health service for families and children. And this was exactly the kind of work I was looking for because I'd been in the hospital system for several years and I was curious to find out how would a mental health service look like if we built it from the ground? And if we based the development of the service on the feedback from the people who we were going to help. So right from the start, we thought it was really important to talk uh, common language because we needed to get people to tell us what they wanted. So we marketed our service in common terms. Uh, we basically said, uh, if you have struggles, uh, come tell us about them. What, you have a problem, come talk to us. We'll figure out what to do. And maybe some of you are thinking, weren't we just overwhelmed by people coming to see us and had to start making these priorities? Uh, you can get help, but you can't because you don't have the right kind of problem. No, that didn't happen. And some of you might think that we needed these lists of therapies to offer because that's what we're trained to, to do, right? But we didn't want to do that because we 
we didn't want to tell people what we thought they needed without making sure it was what they wanted. Because when you, when you stop talking and start listening, people begin to tell you what's important to them and how they want to live their lives and how they want to change and how they want to grow. And then we can offer them the knowledge they need to change because they don't always know that. And it's hard to change all on your own. So this was how it all started. And we've been doing this for three years now. And a couple of months ago, we had a visit. The state secretary of the health department in Norway uh, and the president of the psychological association wanted to visit a mental health service in, in uh, one of the municipalities that was working well. And so they came to us. We were all dressed up and uh, wanted to welcome the visitor from the capital of Oslo. And we sat around this large table and I started to tell them about the people that we meet and what kind of problems they have. And I uh, showed them our results and uh, I told them about our ambitions. And then at one point, the state secretary looks at me and he says, but what is it that you do? <laughs> and I hesitated. And I realized I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> so I just went, uh, well, we do different kinds of stuff. <laughs> 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 this over and over again, why hadn't I prepared for that question, you know, planned to, and I was driving back and forth to work and I was thinking about it and after a while I realized I hadn't prepared for it because in fact it's not an important question. Right. Because we already know what to do. The problem is not that we don't know what to do, we know tons about what to do. You know, families can just show up so we can do it to them. <laughs> And I realized that the question that the state secretary should have asked is, how do you come to know what to do? Right. And this is what Daryl talked about earlier. How do you come to know what to do? We need to describe the process of learning. So here are three things that we think is important when creating a great service and coming to know what to do. And the three things are, one, know your market, two, care about results, and three, create a culture of excellence. <clears throat> and now maybe you're thinking, am I trying to sell a car or something? <laughs> well, you know, the principles are not that different, so, so let me explain. Number one, know your market. When the state secretary asked me, uh, what is it that you do? Uh, I couldn't say to him, psychotherapy, because we do so much more than that. And there's a guy named Cal Newport, he has written a book, So Good They Can't Ignore You. I love that title, by the way. <laughs> and he says, uh, if you want to be truly good at something, you need to know what kind of market you're in, you're operating in. So if you want to be really good at uh, playing the violin, or running the marathon, or writing a novel, you need to practice that one particular skill. You have to practice it deliberately, and that's the only thing that matters, and then you'll, you'll succeed. And he calls this the winner-takes-all market. But then, if you, for example, work in an organization that wants to improve the environment, or you do aid work in Africa, you need a much more diverse set of skills and knowledge because the market is less structured. And he calls this an auction market. And the problem with the mental health services is that we think we're in a winner-takes-all market. If we get really good at doing psychotherapy, then we'll succeed. But the thing is, we're really in an auction market. We need different kinds of things to do, stuff, like I said before, to help people. 
And this is essentially what Bruce Wank will have been saying for over a decade now. Or when people change in therapy, only 13% is due to the treatment effect. You all know this, right? And 87% is due to everything else. <laughs> So when we're so focused about the psychotherapy and trying to come up with the next wonder model, we're missing 87% of the market. And think about how much money we spend, and we're only targeting 13% of the market. Do you know what Howard Schultz of Starbucks would say if you saw this? We should start making frappuccinos. <laughs> and I had one yesterday. It was delicious. <laughs> Number two, care about results. When we started at Stavnia, we had very little resources. Uh, we were only a small project. We didn't know if we were able to grow or even uh, survive. So we thought that if we could deliver great results, then they would have to keep us on. Uh, so we started uh, mapping everything we did. What kind of problems did they have? What kind of help were they asking for? Uh, how long did we see them? Uh, <coughs> if, they, if they left, did they come back? And for how long did they come back? And why? And all, all the point is, all of this information helps us to, to know what kind of results we want and to set goals for ourselves. Mm -hmm. The point is that people need to, to tell us these things. Let me tell you about a man who cared about results. Semmelweis is the, the man who made doctors wash their hands. By the late 19th century, the mortality rate uh, of uh, women dying in childbirth was really high. And Semmelweis had this theory that if he could make doctors wash their hands, mortality rate would go down. So he did experiments, and he published them, and the mortality rate went down by 90%. But the problem was that the rest of the medical community didn't want to listen to him, because they wanted to know why. <laughs> and he couldn't give them a scientific, acceptable scientific explanation as to why it helped to wash one's hands. It simply wasn't evidence-based. But Semmelweis didn't care about that. He just wanted to prevent uh, women from dying. He cared about the salts. Do you want to know what happened to him? Yeah. It's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> he, he died in an insane asylum, <laughs> aged 47, because he was so frustrated that people wouldn't listen to him. So maybe I should stop talking. <laughs> Okay. So now, you need to know what kind of results you want and work yourself backwards. In order to get results, you need to create a culture of excellence. I don't know about you, but Norwegians tend to get a little bit nervous around the word excellence. The Danes and the Swedish are the same, I think. Yeah. So I'm just going to say it one more time, excellence, and we can all get accustomed to it. <laughs> okay. In a culture of excellence, and this is essentially what we're, we're doing at this conference, we're talking about this, so I'm just going to say a little bit about that. People need to be able to make mistakes. And this should be looked upon as a healthy sign of the service. And they need constant feedback on what they're doing so that they can adjust. And I think also it's really important that they have a mentor or a coach uh, that will help them uh, use the feedback that they're getting. Because you want to keep the, the creativity and the spontaneity alive with the people you're working with. A lot of the things we do, we do it with passion when we start off. And very quickly it just falls into this routine, procedural way of, of doing it. Can you recognize that? It's like, it becomes like having a sex out of a book. Next, touch him there. That won't work in a culture of excellence. And most systems are error-phobic. You know, most systems value 
error-free ways of doing things. So we create these guidelines and routines and procedures and we think that this will, will help us uh, to be more, to have improved quality. But it certainly doesn't make us excellent. It makes us mediocre. And it can even make us bad. So this last point, creating a culture of excellence, I think it's the really hard part about creating a great service. Because you have to start doing it right away and you have to do it non-stop, like you were talking about. And it never ends. Now, the field of mental health is like that very first Starbucks. There are no chairs. <laughs> Opera music is grinding into people's ears. <laughs> Bow ties are getting in the way of doing excellent work. And people want something else than whole milk. No, they want non-fat milk. They want frappuccinos. And I think if we took the time and the effort to listen to people and to listen to what they want, we start to see all these possibilities. And we start to see the vastness of where this field could go. Because the potential for helping people in more effective ways is just enormous. Hmm. Now, I have never been more excited about this than I am now. I've been doing this for two, three years. We're starting to see all of these new things. And I would love to work with all of you to make this happen. And if I can be of help to anyone here, just to have a conversation about this, please let me know. Thank you.